Dad was quite a businessman, and uh, we had moved to California while Gary was on his mission. And uh, we were working there and had a big catering company going. I was wedding director of the largest uh, church in Los Angeles, and we were pretty busy. And Dad still yearned to get back to Utah. He loved Utah. And so he called his brother and he said, I have an idea that I could go to game shows and invite California deer hunters to come to Utah to deer hunt. And uh, we, I'd like to know if I could do that on the family ranch out in the Uinta Basin, which Uncle Elvin owned at the time. And Uncle Elvin said, sure, that sounds great. But then a few days later, he called Dad back and he said, I talked to my kids. I think he had 11 kids. And they said, well, I think the idea is good, but we don't need him. We can do it ourselves. And so Uncle Elvin just said, I'm sorry. And Dad wasn't angry at his brother. He was just sorry it didn't work out. And at, we were home on vacation at the time. And we were just sitting around the living room. And, and uh, Dad was saying he wished it had worked out so he could have taken California deer hunters out to the Uinta Basin uh, deer hunting. And Gary said, well, why don't you buy your own ranch? You don't need to use uh, Elvin's ranch and dad said oh there's no ranch on earth that's as incredible as that ranch out in the Uinta Basin and the deer hunting and all and by then Gary had opened the LA Times to uh, the out of out of state properties and he said listen to this and he read uh, the thing the ad in the LA Times that talked about nearly 10,000 acres bordering on Zion National Park and uh, it, it talked about the, the beauty of, of the ponderosa pines and all the greenery and everything on the, on the ranch and my dad was the kind of guy that he would just say well let's go and, and so they called the number on the, in, the, in the newspaper and the man said he would meet them at the <coughs> ranch and uh, as I remember we all climbed in dad's Cadillac, uh, Lincoln Continental rather, and, and took a ride up to uh, up to the ranch and uh, then they we came up the county road up to the three cabins that's not even near where we are right now but up by brushy cove and uh they talked about it and dad had a thousand dollars in his pocket from the catering the night before and he gave him the thousand dollars and signed over the family house in California and and uh, we were on our, that was the beginnings and dad went down to Kane County and met with the council down there and they said sure that'd be fine and so dad hired uh, a surveyor surveyed uh, 150 lots out along the, the park fence and uh, then uh, he, he, this uh, this ranch was actually not a, a, a piece of, that was legally one piece it was a whole bunch of homesteads and we didn't know it at the time but these guys had a racket going they had uh, offered this ranch as a cattle ranch but there wasn't enough grass here to have enough cattle to pay the taxes and so they had sold it uh, two or three times or four or five I don't know exactly how many and uh, they saw us coming and thought well here's some more city slickers that won't know how to raise cattle out on this property because it wasn't a good cattle ranch anyway and uh, so uh, dad uh, got his brother-in-law who was an attorney Ray Brown to get the whole thing legally put together as one big ranch 
And uh, then when he had this surveyed map and he had the, all the paperwork, he went back to the King County Commission again and laid it out and said, this is what we're going to start selling. And they said, no, we, we don't want to do that. And my dad, I, I have a, a half page written in his handwriting where he said he all but got on his knees and said, you've ruined me if, if this is the case. They've taken my home, they've taken my money, and we, we just begged them. And they finally said okay, and, and he could go ahead and do it. And uh, we, uh, as, as we were at our little family, we all knew that, every, and I'm the oldest of nine children, we all knew that we had the responsibility to be here at Memorial Weekend to get the place open for the spring. And then we were required to be here for Labor Day and Dad would put on a big feed for the people who bought lots and uh, we would all be, we were all expected to be here to help for that. Let me just go back a little bit and tell you that after Dad bought this property. He went down around in Mount Carmel and Orderville and, and started asking where's the best deer hunting in this whole area? And they all started to say Pine, they all said Pine Knoll, different people he'd talked to and finally he said to one of those old codgers, where is this Pine Knoll I keep hearing about? And he said, well you damn fool, you own it. And it's right here looking out of our window, Pine Knoll, and that's, that's uh, always been a, a really special uh, deer hunting spot. Even though now this is a very popular resort, it's, we still celebrate the deer hunt and the deer hunters still come and they have all this land where they can hunt. So dad opened up the first subdivision and this was a subdivision that had no uh, rules. People could put up a tent, they could put, drag on a trailer, they could do whatever they wanted on it. And uh, they had an acre of land and in the beginning they paid fifty dollars and that was what he called um, hunting dues I think and if you didn't pay your hunting dues then you couldn't hunt but if you paid your hunting dues then when they had a deer hunting license he would give had a little card that said they had were up to date on their hunting dues and they had um, we had the sheriff come up and he would check not only the deer hunting license but check to make sure that they had their they were up to date on their hunting dues well we mother and dad would spend most of the summer here and dad was such a great salesman that when he would someone would come and he would talk to him about the property he would uh, so I know the exact spot. I know exactly what you would like because some places are high and other places are low and dad would say oh I know just what you want. I never saw him show more than one piece of property. He always made him feel like he had that special one just for them. And uh, but he, he made a mistake in that he would say, and you can have up to that big pine tree, or you can have over to that big rock. Even though he had it all surveyed, he, was, he, do, he wasn't strict enough in taking, um, keeping the, the property lines. And so we had a little problem that was starting because of that. But at the same time, and this was when dad was in his 80s, uh, he would come, he, Scott came to our house, Scott's my youngest brother, and he came to our house one day and he said, mom and dad can't keep up that big summer work every summer. We've got to give them a couple of thousand dollars a month and there's the only way we can, we, we, we barely make enough to pay the taxes and do the roads, uh, about eight, 
thousand dollars a year to keep the roads going and uh, and he said w we we can't do it so uh, he, and he, he had he showed me a contract and I still have that contract where every one of my siblings eight signatures on the line ready to sell the ranch so that they could provide for mother and dad and I, I just said over my dead body and refused to sign it. And so we <coughs> went back and talked to mother and dad about it, talked to Scott, went to Scott's house the next week and he cried. He said, I don't want to sell it any more than you do. But I said, just give us a chance. Let us try to, to do to solve the problems and what they had to do was because of this problem I mentioned they had to resurvey all the lots again and Kane County allowed us to add another 50 lots so then that meant we had uh, 200 lot subdivision uh, but we had uh, over 50 that we could sell maybe 75 and so uh, mother and our, our, my Gary's brother had already um, deeded the ranch giving as how much as he could to the all nine kids so that we could legally take the ranch so much at a time and we did this over a series of years so we had stock uh, owning land but we also had voting rights and so mother just said there's no way nine children can agree on this if we're going to give you a fighting chance to save the ranch we've got to take away the voting stock of everybody and just give you the let you keep the ownership of the ranch but you give you the voting stock to just the three of you and so um I, I think they extended that after and gave a little bit to two others, but the m majority of the stock, I was the president, Scott was the vice president, and my old sister Penny was the secretary. And <clears throat> over the next um, year or two, Gary sold over a million dollars worth of property out there that, that, that saved the ranch, but still, it was not it was it was tight it really was and then the next big thing happened was someone said to David you know I think you guys have the best hike in design right off your property and he was talking about the Orderville hike and um, it's, it seems so strange to me that David didn't take the hike with his friend. Instead, he took him out and dropped him off and went around and picked him up and said, how was it? Which seems strange, but so the next uh, spring, the next time we had everyone together, and I can't remember if it was spring or fall, it was, it seems like yesterday, but we were all in a group and, and, and some of them, we're going to go on this big hike that was 13 miles and would take eight hours and we had kind of a dramatic moment because my brother-in-law Willard England said of our youngest son I will not motivate push pull or encourage Mark Neeleman on this hike if he goes then he's on his own and Mark was so angry that he was the first one down the hike just to prove to his uncle that he could do it but any Anyway, as they went on this big hike, uh, <coughs> David and Stephen sat on a rock and agreed that this, this ranch it was too good to keep just for our family and for those 200 people that owned lots out there, that they had to do something to try to start a resort and they, what they did was go into Brushy Cove and had camp spots. And then people said, we don't want a camp, we want a bed to sleep in. And then that was sort of the beginnings of the resort. It was so fun when 
all of us had our young children. Uh, I remember we had one reunion when we had, my mother and dad had 105 from mother and dad and their nine children and the grandchildren and, and those that had married in. And, and now my husband and I are up here this weekend with 91 of our family. And, and it, but it's totally different. When, when we just had all the, all the family here, we started out with a tent and then dad pulled a trailer in and then he built around the trailer so that he had steps going up and a, and a big platform and a living room. And so in other words, the trailer was mother and dad's bedroom, a big living room. And, and then, but we'd come in and sometimes we'd get here at midnight and mother would always have the bed ready for us. And the favorite, favorite beds were out on the side. I believe there were four that dad had along that trailer that he'd put up what if it rained but then it, it, they'd put it down when they, they were ready for us to come and we could lay on those beds and just stare up at the stars and it was just incredible and the kids would make uh, playhouses out in the trees or they would uh, build a tree I remember one brother-in-law built a tree house for all for the little boys and that was where they would all congregate and Penny my little sister had the best playhouse as a, as a little girl she's Penny was born uh, just about the time I got married so she was like one of the grandkids almost and and it was just so fun but the big thing was catching salamanders and pollywogs and finding arrowheads that was the big act activity and there was such a funny story about Penny's daughter she was such an intelligent little girl she typed her dad's doctorate thesis and yet she never was able to catch one of the salamanders and and so she felt bad because she could never really be one of the salamander kids and there's a, such a great story that Daniel wrote for a school assignment where Daniel he's our oldest grandchildren grandchild by the way but this story is in is in the book that we wrote at the end of David's chapter and it's so cute because he tells about driving that four and a half hours to the ranch and how he, he would, tried so hard not to get car sick etc but then all of a sudden he felt the, the dirt road and that meant that they were they were here because it was a dirt road up to the ranch in those days and then he said every the he said the favorite thing was everybody could jump out and run and do whatever they wanted but they got to do it with all their cousins and and that's what was so special about it and it was just a great time for all of all, all of us growing up with our young kids and coming here Tell me about Ray's big dinner that he would throw together, cooking in the ground and everything. Okay, my dad was a New Zealand missionary. And uh, by the way, later in later years, Gary and I went to Rotorua where we had a meal that was cooked like dad would do it up here. But what he would do is it, he would start on Friday and he had a, a big a trench already built, uh, deep. I mean like six feet deep where he would throw logs and 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 pieces of logs in into this thing and he'd it burn uh, those and and it, all day on Friday to get ready and then Friday night he had a, had had it all fixed up where he had a basket where he would put a full beef in wrapped up in tin foil in these baskets that were up, extended over the top and then he had a metal piece and rocks on it and throw dirt on it even and that would sit there all night and cook and so the next morning at about 10 o'clock everyone would gather around to take all this dirt and rocks and tin piece off and open it up and it was always cooked 
perfectly. But then all, all the people that owned the property out in that first uh, subdivision would start arriving at about 11 or 30 or quarter to 12. And my dad always gave a beautiful blessing on the food and bless the ranch and and all, we were all there to help with that barbecue. We had the beef cooked under the ground. We had corn on the cob. We had sliced tomatoes. We had cucumbers that were in vinegar. We had hot rolls that Billy Brinkerhoff's wife would make. And then we had watermelon for dessert. And it was just the most amazing feed you can imagine. They still do that, but they do it now in the restaurant of the resort.